Can you please close your eyes? Lord, in this world that we live, which is ruled by Satan, every moment he barks, he roars like a lion, threatening us, giving us different kinds of fear. And we are so used to depression, anxiety and stress that instead of hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd, Lord, we have been hearing these voices and in that threat, going into a shell and becoming a victim all our life, Father. Lord Jesus, you conquered the grave, we sang that song. We sang that song, oh Lord, that you are risen and you are alive. Lord, we did not only sing those words, we believe those words, Lord. We believe, oh Lord, you are alive. No matter, no matter what, what the devil is talking to us and threatening us, oh Lord. We refuse to believe the words of the devil because we do not hear the voice of a stranger. We hear your voice, Jesus. You are the good shepherd and we are your sheep. And we hear your voice through your holy word. As you have gathered us over here, speak to us, Almighty Redeemer, who is alive. Speak to every one of us, Lord. Your, 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 your mystery that is hidden, Lord, this mystery is hidden. And it cannot be understood with our natural human mind, but only by your spirit, O Lord. O Spirit of God, enlighten us. Speak to us through the Holy Word and make us understand the truth the truth that will set us free. Amen. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, when we started the worship, the PowerPoint was working, everything was going on fine, and all of a sudden, everything goes wrong. And this is what happens in our life. All of a sudden, things go wrong. And when things go wrong, we need a person who has the knowledge to fix it right. And there was this person who was struggling all throughout to fix it right. And thank God, it got fixed. And we could look on the screen, understand those words and sing along. And that's exactly what we did. God wants to show us through the Holy Scriptures, the mysteries that are hidden in the Holy Eucharist. And He wants to reveal it to us because unless we understand them, we will never be able to use them. Most of us have got smartphones and these smartphones are used to call but on, on, in the same smartphones there are different applications that you can download when somebody gives you the knowledge of it and when you download those applications you can use them. Is it right? Yes. And when you use them you are so fascinated and you are saying wow my phone works multi-purpose and in the same way Jesus wants to show us the kind of things that happen in the Holy Eucharist. Are you ready? Yes. I said, are you ready? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first thing is that, you know, when you come to the Holy Eucharist, the most important thing is that you believe that He's alive. He has risen and He is with me. And when I come to the Holy Eucharist, He comes to meet me over there and change my life forever. Amen. So let's quickly go to the scriptures to back up what I'm going to speak to you in Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, verse number 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together all these things which had happened. Now, now, this is after Jesus' resurrection. Let me give you the background. After Jesus' resurrection, the woman had got. And they have seen, they have got the information that Jesus has risen. Uh, Peter and John have gone to the tomb and they have found the tomb empty. They have not found the body. And the angels have said to the woman that Jesus has risen. They have got all this news and after hearing all this news, uh, all this news, these two who are the disciples, close members of Jesus, have made a decision to leave Jerusalem and go to Emmaus. 
And they talk together all these things which have happened. They're talking about the things that happened, first of all, on that Sunday, the Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, everybody wanted to make him a king, praise God. And the very after four or five days, these very people who wanted to make him a king has now proclaimed, crucify him. Why the difference? Why? Praise God. We'll study all that. And it came to pass that they communed together and reasoned. Jesus drew himself drew near and went with him. So these were the people who were walking and when they were walking uh, about seven miles from Jerusalem, they were discussing about the incidents that had happened and their mind is all on Jesus. But they do not understand why these things have happened. Because on Palm Sunday, on that Sunday, when Jesus entered in, they had believed that Jesus is the Son of God. They had seen Jesus doing marvelous things. He could open blind eyes, he could open deaf ears, he could multiply uh, the food, he, could, uh, he was an excellent teacher, he even raised the dead. They had seen all these things. He was even casting out demons. They could see the move of God through his hand and they believed that he is the Messiah who would come and deliver them from the Roman Empire. And they had seen that he was an excellent candidate just like Moses was a candidate to deliver the Israelites out of Pharaoh's bondage in Egypt. Praise God. So they had all this desire and they had believed in Jesus on that Sunday when he entered into Jerusalem on a donkey and they wanted to make him a king that very moment. But after a few days, on a Friday, they see that very, the very person whom we believe who had excellent power, that he could use God's power and deliver the people, on Friday they see the person, the candidate on whom they believe is helpless. He has been scourged, he has been wounded, there's a crown of thorns piercing his head, he's bleeding all over, in fact, he's bleeding his lash. He can, they can see all that and now they can see that this candidate in whom we had believed, we had put our faith has got no power. He is not, not even fighting back. He is not retaliating. He is not using any of God's power. Their faith is gone. And now they see that Jesus has not only been crucified, he has died before the eyes. All their hope is gone. And now on Sunday morning, they get the news that he is risen. But nobody has seen him. And that's the time these two men are going on talking about all this and they are actually disappointed, they are depressed, they, they, they are moving in the wrong direction. Jesus wants them to be in Jerusalem because they misinterpreted Jesus' death on the cross and the resurrection that he had already spoken. They were depressed. And actually speaking, the ones who are supposed to be in Jerusalem because it was a good news day because Jesus had risen, he had conquered death, he had destroyed Satan, praise God, oh, yeah. and, and, and he rose again for you and me so that through him we also get victory over death because we are baptized in Jesus. All that was a good news but not knowing the truth, <laughs> interpreting the wrong things in your mind, they were going in the wrong direction. And that's, how, that's what happens in our lives as well. When we do not understand the truth, the lies of the devil begins to, uh, begins to put pressure in our mind and we, we take wrong decisions, we speak wrong words, we go into wrong actions and we begin to uh, go in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what happened to them. And, but even in the wrong direction, they were still thinking about Jesus. Hallelujah. And look what happened when, when they were thinking about Jesus. And it came to pass when they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near. The good news is, I might get lost in my thinking, in my understanding. I might not know the truth, but here is the good news that Jesus is saying that he will never leave us, never forsake us. He will come in search of us all the time, all the time. He will and leave you in the right direction. Can you give the Lord a big hand for that? Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. But what is very important is 
the land going in the wrong direction, these two men were still talking about Jesus. When I'm going in the wrong direction, am I talking about Jesus, about the scriptures, or am I talking about the things of the world? The Bible says Jesus himself came to them. Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't know what you're going through, my friend, but the Redeemer lives. When you sing that song, my Redeemer lives, he is alive. He is alive not to leave you in a bondage, not to leave you in a crisis. He is alive so that he can draw you out of that valley and take you to that destination that Father God has planned and purposed for each one of us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then, when they come in together and reason, Jesus himself draw near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. When Jesus' is resurrection and Jesus came and spoke to them and when he drew close to them, he was a stranger. They could not recognize him. For what reason? We do not know. But they could not recognize him. Praise God. And Jesus began to talk to them. And he said to them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk? And why are you so sad? Praise God. He is asking them, Can you tell me what's wrong? What are you talking? So that I can make some correction in your life. Praise God. Why are you sad? How does a person become sad? A person becomes sad when his mind is on anything other than the truth. Might be you're going through any kind of mountain, any kind of situation in life, and that is threatening you again and again. You can be very, very sad. But at the same time, when you look into the scripture, the scripture says, when you praise God and you thank God and you are in the presence of God, even though you do not understand how to get get out of this mountain that is coming against you, but if you are only thanking and praising God because you are doing it in obedience, the Bible says, hills begin to melt like wax in the presence of God. And you don't know what's happening. You are trying your best with all that you knowledge that you have, but it's not going. And in fact, the mountain is becoming taller and taller. But here is the Lord saying to us, if you can praise Him, praise Him for what? The problem with us is we praise God for all the things and the positions and all those things that He has given us. We keep thanking God for all those things. But what happens when those things that He has given us goes away from us? We are once again sad. Our thanking and praising should be for what He has done for us on the cross that can never be taken from us. It's eternal. Hallelujah. My salvation is eternal. The, he has baptized in me is eternal. He has given me the Holy Spirit is eternal. All that He has done on the cross, if I keep reminding myself and recollecting and thanking God, then those things cannot be taken away. But you will be talking about the things which are on this earth and you are praising and thanking God for those things. Those things are temporary and they keep on changing and when they keep on changing, our thanksgiving and praise also keeps on changing. Is it right? Yes. Hello. So can we change our mind from today and start praising God for who He is and who and what He has done and how much He loves us and how much He cares for us that He sent His Son Jesus to deliver us from sin, to deliver us from hell and give us heaven as an eternal home. You can talk to yourself and say, I don't care what's happening on this earth, but one thing that cannot be changed is I have an eternal home with my Lord in heaven and devil, you can't stop that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So he began to ask them, why are you so sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Are you only a stranger in Jerusalem, and has not known the things which have come to pass there in these days? And he said to them, What things? Now listen to them. And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which Come on, read that, please. Which? No, hold on, hold on. Which? 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 As long as Jesus is was for you, you are sad. When Jesus is for you, you are all the time rejoicing. Hello. For them, Jesus was because he died. They never believed he rose. And as long as you are looking at Good Friday, that he died, you will be sad all the time. That's, but the good news is, he conquered death on 
mountains talk to you and threatens you with different kinds of situations in your life, can you talk to yourself and say, Jesus is no, was, Jesus is with me? And as long as that Jesus was is there, you are all the time sad. Ask your neighbor, is Jesus was or is to you? <laughs> I, 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 listen, listen, I want to tell you, these, these were the people who actually physically lived with Jesus. They ate with Jesus, they walked with Jesus, they saw Jesus perform such wonders and all those things. But Jesus, even before his crucifixion, had given them the news that I would be crucified, but I got news to tell you, on the third day I will rise up again. Praise God. But they refused to believe. Today, if there is sadness in my life, it's because of my unbelief. It's because of my doubt. It's because I still believe Jesus was. See, when, when you say I believe Jesus is, then always it is that when I believe something, my action always corresponds to the message. When you were singing my Redeemer lives and I was watching and I was saying, God, if only we understand the kind of price that you paid to, to, to bring us out of slavery of sin and death and eternal damnation, if I only think about that, I can tell you, Lord, I can stand on the rooftop and scream and scream and scream and keep continuing to say, thank you, Lord, and it will not get empty because of what you did for me. But in the same Let's say we are not in the church, we are in some uh, conference and there when you enter, they gave you one coupon and each one had numbers on it and, and they came and said there is a lucky number and you got that number and you got only uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 lakhs dirhams as a gift. How do you say? Hello, just 10 lakhs. A uh, 1 million? Okay, you know better. It's not 1 million. It's not one million, ten ten thousand lakhs dirhams. They don't know how to total lot of money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ten lakhs, ten lakhs uh, dirhams. It's one million. Okay, one million. Uh, praise God. One million uh, dirhams. Indian rupees. <laughs> so so now 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 when you get that as a gift. Because when you entered it, they gave you all one one number and you got that gift. How do you be? Me, I got that. Me. Or will you be screaming? Hello, hello, will you be screaming or will you be just saying, hey, that number is mine? <laughs> there will be no excitement. Oh, me, that's me. Will it be like that? And, this is, and let me tell you, after getting that one million dirhams, Let's say you bought it and you bought it in your hand and you were so happy and you got knocked off and you died. <laughs> okay, let's say you died. Let's say you died. Can you take that million off? No. But when you meet Jesus, he takes you to <laughs> heaven. Uh -huh. We are all the time fighting for things that we are going to leave over here. Hello? That's why their the problem was Jesus was. Jesus was. The problem in our life also when we are going through some situation, Jesus was. I can say with my mouth, Jesus is, but my action corresponding to the message is showing there is sadness in me. Because when I am sad, my thinking, my believing is not on the scriptures, it's on the situation or circumstances that is going on. And that's exactly what happened to them. They were sad because their focus was on Good Friday. Their focus was that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one who would set us free. And all that hope is gone. Look at this, look at this. And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But, we listen to this, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. So what was their thinking? Their thinking was that Jesus would be the Messiah who would deliver us from the Roman Empire. Because the Romans were torturing them, taxing them, uh, making their life miserable. And their focus was only one thing. 
Just like Moses delivered us from Egypt of slavery, in the same way Jesus is going to deliver us from the Roman Empire. Praise God. And why did they believe that? Why did they believe that? Listen, why did they believe that? Because they believed that just as Moses had no army, but he had God's power. And God used his power on Moses when he said that this time there is going to be a plague. And this plague in Egypt is every firstborn child will be killed. But in the house of Israel, when you offer a lamb, a Passover lamb, and sprinkle the blood on the doorpost and eat of the flesh, the angel of death that is coming into Egypt will look at the blood on the doorpost and pass over, not pass into. The angel of death that passed into the house killed the firstborn male child. But the angel of death that passed over the blood of the lamb had protected them. So through this power of God, when all the male, including the house of Pharaoh, his son died, he was broken, depressed, and at that very moment at night, he summoned Moses and Aaron and told them, please take your people and whatever you want and get out of Egypt. So they remembered that. And this was the time of the Passover feast. And they were all excited that Jesus would be used by God to set them free from the Roman Empire. And that did not happen. Praise God. How many times we have made our own desires and those desires did not happen? What happens to us? Hello, what happens to us? We are depressed. And how strange. They want to, they, they, they are saying that Jesus is dead. And supposing you were Jesus and those two disciples who are on the way and they, they are talking about Jesus is dead, he has not risen and they are talking about that and you want to introduce yourself and tell them, see I am alive. Won't you just get, go and stand there and say, hey look at me, I am alive. Won't you do that? But look at Jesus. He does not want to make them known through his physical appearance he wants to make them known through the Holy Scriptures. In the same way, Jesus wants to make us known, Him known to us through the Holy Scriptures. And it is through Holy Scripture, when the Holy Spirit gives us the understanding of the Holy Scriptures, you don't need any more evidence on the outside because the spiritual evidence is so strong that you are convicted, you are strong, you are confident to believe the unseen. Praise God. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, oh, can I ask? You won't get mad with me? Hello. How many of you, especially the, the men, we, men we use it all the time. How many of us, um, means the ladies, use the mirror this morning? Because men, see I did not use the mirror because I did not get time to shave. But, but uh, you know men, all chikna. They have shaved and come, they have to use the mirror. Ladies, they don't have beard, no, no need of mirror. Praise God. Hello, have you used the mirror? Yes. Why did you use the mirror? Because we have never seen our face. The only way we can see our face is through the mirror. Do we believe the mirror? Because the mirror always shows you natural things and never lies to you. Some mirrors do lie. Now you see what mirror, there are some mirrors which are made special when you stand, you look like this and you look like this. No, those mirrors are, uh, you know, corrupted mirrors, praise God. But the natural good mirrors, they show you natural things. Do we believe those mirrors? Yes. yes. In the same way, Jesus wants to show his disciples a mirror that is created by God. And this mirror is spiritual and that mirror is called the Holy Scriptures. You begin to look through that mirror and you see the unseen things made visible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you give the Lord a big hand? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's take, let's take for a moment. You got a natural mirror, that is your eyes, showing you natural things. And on the other side, you got a spiritual mirror, that's the, the, the Holy Scriptures, which you read. 
somebody of your loved ones said some words and on the other side Jesus is saying his words. Which words do we receive, believe and act on? The natural mirror or the spiritual mirror? As long as my mind is on the natural mirror, my life will be always, always a life, happiness, sadness, happiness, sadness, like the ECG graph. But if my eyes are fixed on the spiritual mirror, it's constant, it's constant, it's constant, it's constant, it's constant, it's joyful. Praise God. And that's what, that's what Jesus wants to talk to these disciples. He never revealed himself and said, look, it's me. Uh -huh. He's talking to them through the scriptures. Watch this. But we trusted that it had been he who, which should have redeemed his life. And they said all this. Today is the third day since these things were done. Yes, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the tomb. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen visions of angels which said that he was alive. Did they get the news from the woman that he was alive? Yes. Yeah. Did they believe? Really? No. Praise God. Then, and certain of them which were with us went to the tomb and found it uh, even as the womb, as the woman had said, but him they saw not. So, did they have news that he's alive? Yes. Did they believe? So, if you are sad, what's the reason? Has Jesus spoken to us in his written word? Yes. yes. Have you read it? And if somebody is come and explaining to you, do you choose to believe it? And if you don't believe it, then like these two disciples, we will be walking in the opposite direction. Praise God. And then Jesus said to them, You fools, can't you see my wounds? Can't you see me? It's me, Jesus. All that prophets have spoken. Praise God. Come on, read that, please. O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now had this prophet spoken again and again and again and again about the Messiah? Yes. yes. The prophecies were given about the Messiah, how he would suffer and what he would do. Everything was there and Jesus was teaching them for three and a half years all these things. But did they choose to believe when the time came? What happens to us? We listen to the word of God over here. We get excited. My Redeemer lives. We are dancing. We are screaming. And then we go out of the door. And there the lion who is roaring. The devil who is roaring like a lion. He's not a lion. Roaring like a lion. He's screaming in your ears. All the things that you are going through. Now which one do you choose to believe? Because when you choose to believe. Your situation. You are depressed. I just came from Ireland. And I was crying over there. Because when I saw over there, those people, out of five, are four in depression. Out of five, four are with arthritis. Out of five, three are with cancer. And, and, and you know what touched my heart is, these people don't sit more than 45 minutes in the church. And these people would come in the afternoon and we would wind up at 11.15 at night and we would do it all the time. And then I went there, I told this brother I can come only once a year because the whole timetable is fixed. But the first day when I saw them, I was crying because they had no knowledge of the word of God. And I was crying on my bed and I said, God, please get me here again and again. And I've decided now, all this time I will go to the same place, never change my place. And I said, God, take me to the places where these people have not heard the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They, they not only really heard the word. See, there is one thing. You hear the word. But what they heard, the Holy Spirit manifested with signs and wonders. That's when their eyes were opened. That's when they began to realize for every situation, Jesus has given us 
His word. He has given us His word. And it is only when we change our thinking, because we are all trained over here to believe according to our senses. And people who believe according to senses never enter into the supernatural. People who train themselves to believe in the unseen, on the word of God, the knowledge that comes from the word of God, and they make decisions to believe in those words and, and act on those words, these are the ones who will always operate in the supernatural. The kind of things that God does in their life is beyond their capacity, beyond their ability. If I am standing here today, my friend, it's not because I'm strong, I'm powerful, I'm weak, absolutely weak. But the only difference is, I choose not to believe my senses, I choose to believe what God says in His Word. That's the difference. Oh, that's only the difference. That's only the difference. It's a practice. It's a training. And that's what Jesus wants to tell them. Hey fools, I was with you for such a long time. I've spoken to you my words. Why don't you believe in your heart? And that's what he says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? If Jesus had to suffer things and enter into his glory, we as his disciples, are how are we going to enter into his glory? Can we enter into his glory without suffering? Can we enter into his glory without being tested? How many of you would like to go from, here, from Dubai to uh, India? 10 free tickets on this flight. This airline has started. 10 free tickets. But the, air, the flight, the plane has never been tested before. You are the first passenger to go here. <laughs> Hello, what happened? Why are you laughing? 10 tickets free. Hello? And, and no economy class. Uh, from this end to that end, full bed. Business class, first class, semi-bola. Shower, you are some. And Wi-Fi also. Come on, all these facilities are here. Would you like to go in that flight? Come on. Because it has to be tested. In the same way, our relationship with God has to be tested. And in this testing, there's always going to be suffering. Did you see that brother? He, he has got knowledge about the... Uh, the uh, projector and all that. Now, a situation comes, he does everything and at the end he realized that there was a fault in the cable. He was trying his best to get the sticks. But he also had to go through the test and then he got it. Now, because he passed the test, we are all blessed. <laughs> in the same way, when you pass the test, you are not only really blessed. The test that you have passed, you will teach others how to pass their test. <laughs> Hello? Is it right? Are we willing to go through that suffering? Because, because our mindset is, see our mindset is, you come to Jesus, Jesus will solve your problem. So when there is a problem, there is a, there's something wrong. No, 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 no. When you come to Jesus, the problems will be there. But the good news is, He will teach you how to overcome the problems. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many people will say, come to Jesus, you won't get drowned. No, 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 you will get drowned, but he will teach you how to swim and be on the water and enjoy that water. Are you, are you understanding? Are, are, you, are you getting it? Hello, are you getting it? Can I see some smile if you believe? After sharing all this and still you're like, <laughs> They started out to change, yeah? Come on. They were sad because they did not understand. Now you are understanding? Yeah, good, good, good. Praise God. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? So can you make up your mind? Listen, there are two sides of the coin. Jesus will surely bless us. But on the other side is suffering. Suffering in what? In testing of our faith. When we are ready to go through that suffering, to test our faith, our genuineness, and, and to believe and continue to believe and to be a doer of the world, surely you will see the glory of God in your life. And then people look at you, they will say, He doesn't deserve. Even I know I don't deserve. Even I know. But what to do? When I'm using His grace more and more, I go beyond my capacity, beyond my ability, and the manifestation of God's glory shows up because I believe in Him. If anybody has to check my profile, I will be the first one to get disqualified. Praise God. But thank God, God gives his word and says, son, can you believe in this word? 
Yes, Lord, I believe that. Tell your neighbor, believe in the word of God, not your senses. Now somebody will say, if I don't have to believe my senses, why did God give me senses? Okay, God gave you senses so that he would help, those senses would help you to live in the physical world better, but not to rule over your life and go against God's word. For example, if there was no sense of smell, okay, if there was no sense of smell, and the gas was warm, but no fire, you went out and you came in, you don't have smell. So now what will happen? At the home. <laughs> will it happen? Okay, you had no sense of pain when you touch. Let's say you were talking to your friend and the cooking was going on and the gas was on and you kept your hand on the fire and you were talking. After some time, it's tandoori chicken. God gave you those senses. Why? So that you can make decisions which will help you. But those decisions which are contradicting to God's word, those senses have to be crucified on the cross permanently. Nobody liked it. Okay, Lord, not me. <laughs> but let me ask you, if I don't get crucified, can I get resurrection? No. no. But if I'm willing to get crucified of myself, my flesh, or anything contradicting to God's word, is resurrection guaranteed? Yes. yes. But there are some who are not ready to get crucified. They're running, 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 running. For them, the Good Friday is for years. Hello? You can run, 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 run. And make your Good Friday long, so long that one day, Amen. <laughs> and then they put on you RIP. What is that? Greater than possible. How quickly am I ready to get crucified to myself on the cross by dying to myself to obey God's word? Praise God. And looking at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things concerning them. So Jesus started with the Old Testament, one after another, and he kept on talking to them. And they were supposed to walk how many miles? Seven miles. Praise God. Seven miles journey, they are talking scriptures. Praise God. And they drew near unto the village where they went. And he made as though he was he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Praise God. Imagine two more than how many how much can it will take seven miles? Seven miles more than two kilometers away, right? I know some people are good mathematics. 11? Okay, 11 kilometers. 11 kilometers walk. How much time? Thank God they were men, they talk, walk faster. <laughs> Two, three hours? I did not say marathon walking. Uh, fast walking, slowly, okay. Uh, two, three hours. Two, three hours, Jesus is giving them a sermon on all these scriptures. Did their eyes open? Did they recognize Jesus? Come on. They did not recognize Jesus. Praise God. Now when they reached the village, they wanted to go to their place and Jesus pretending that he is going ahead. Okay. What did they say? Look, look what he said. Then it is towards evening and the day is far spent. Listen, it's going to get dark. And it's not good for you to travel in the dark. So why don't you come and stay with us? Are they welcoming Jesus? Yes. And that's what Jesus says. He always comes to our rescue. He's always speaking to us. But we are all the time listening to the voice of anything and everything that's not God's word. We get so caught up with the things of the world. Today I met somebody and then somebody said, you know, I was taking uh, uh, counseling from some people and I got fear. It's very important that when somebody is talking to you, 
Is that somebody building you up on the scriptures or is that person giving you advice of the world? Because the Bible says when you are taking advice, any advice from the worldly system which is contradicting to God's word, you will be like a tree that's planted in the desert and no sprinklers there. <laughs> Praise God. Here in Dubai they are planting. You will say, in Dubai the plants are so No, they are drippers and sprinklers. But this tree will be without water. It will dry up and it will be dead. But if you are with a person who is delighting in the Lord, in the word of God, if you are, you are all the time meditating on his word, then you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves will never dry. Now somebody say, what's the use of the leaves never drying? Leaves are always for the tree. They produce food. In other words, if you are delighting in God's word day and night, you will always be blessed. Praise God. Hallelujah. You will, you will bear fruit in season. Fruit is not for you, but fruit is for others. You will be so fruitful that people will come and pluck fruits from you. And their lives will be changed. They will be nourished because of you. And now, whatever you do shall prosper. Praise God. But what will people say? People will say, Hey brother, can you lay hands on me and pray? Okay, I lay hands on you and pray. But what are you meditating? Scriptures or problems? Hallelujah. Do we want permanent solution or temporary solution? That's why Jesus did not reveal himself to them. He is showing them scriptures of the scriptures for their minds to understand. To see that these are the things that were said and these are the things that you saw in the physical that happened before your eyes. Are they not matching? It's not coincidence. It is exactly those prophecies coming true. He is showing them all those things but their minds are closed. Hallelujah. Amen. And now when they welcome him, he comes home and now what? see what happens. And he went in to tell him them and it came to pass. As he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to them. And the eyes were opened. You know, this line touched me in such a way. I'll tell you, in my own life, um, when I got, uh, when I was brought to the church, because um, my case was a demonic with depression and I lost my mind. So when I was brought to that place in Bombay, the Eucharist was going on. And this priest told my wife because he could not speak to me because I, I did not know my name and my memory was gone. So he told my wife, bring him here for nine days of Eucharist. Bring him here to, for the praise of divine mercy. And this Eucharist over there would be for two and a half hours where the priest would preach the word of God for one hour, then the mass, and then during the mass one hour, and then after receiving the body and blood of Jesus, he would have the healing anointing session. And that's where the healing would take place. Now, I did not know then, but now when I see, the Bible says that it was when Jesus offered his body and blood and gave it to them, all those scriptures that they had heard, they had no full revelation of those words. But the moment they received the body and blood, the revelation was enlightened. Are you, are you, are you understanding? The fullness of the, the, the secrets that were hidden, even though Jesus spoke the scriptures, the scriptures became absolutely alive and they could recognize Jesus. And that's why I did not know then, and I, I, after I got healed, I got healed in six, six seven days. And when I, when I, um, after nine days, I began to go every morning for mass. But at that time, I did not know. But every morning, I would go for mass and receive body and blood. And I saw that a person who had no knowledge of the word, all of a sudden, getting passionately hungry for the word and God began to reveal his secrets to me and this when I was preparing the talk for Eucharist this scripture touched me and that's the time I began to reflect hey I was receiving the body and blood and that's when these scriptures became alive to me 
And from the time I began to make these notes, now every day I'm looking for ways how I can go and receive the body and blood and life is getting better, stronger and beautiful. My friends, if you are thinking it's only the word of God, even I was thinking, I'm not telling you a lie. But I have begun to realize that coming to Jesus for the Eucharist is when these words become flesh in us. <clears throat> so let us take every opportunity that we receive where Jesus himself is inviting us to come for the Eucharist. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. It means celebrating. Why are you celebrating? You are celebrating because you are recollecting what Jesus has done on the cross for you and me. You are recollecting his whole life, his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And that same Jesus is saying to you, just as I had victory, I will give you my body, I will give you my blood, I will give you my life and I will make you like me. I will make you like me. Oh my God, I will make you like me. Oh my God, help me. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. And the eyes were opened and they knew him. Now the question is, do I know about him or do I know him? Because when I know about him, I cannot move in faith. But when I know him, I can trust him. And the only way I can know him is through the scriptures and those scriptures becoming alive when I come for the Eucharist. Now Jesus did not, Jesus did not uh, just give them the whole body and blood. He first spoke to them scriptures. He first began to reveal to them the prophecies that are given. And in the same way, we need the word and we need the Eucharist. Amen? Amen. 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 And the eyes were open. Can we just close the eyes for a moment and talk to Jesus? And first of all, might be many of you must have come to the Eucharist and never understood. And it would have been just like a ritual. But today the Lord is Himself talking to us. He's saying to us, That these disciples who were actually living with him, Jesus was physically present and he spoke the scriptures, yet they were not able to recognize. My friend, believing comes by the grace of God. And that grace is in abundance when we come for the Eucharist. They had the problems. They had the wrong thinking or misunderstanding. But as they were talking about Jesus, Jesus drew himself to them. And Jesus himself is giving us an example of these disciples who had a great desire for Jesus. But misunderstanding the scriptures, they went in the wrong direction. And the only way they could get back to Jerusalem was when they received the word and very important the Holy Communion the body and blood that gave them the power and the help to come back my friend God wants us to remember in the Holy Eucharist the presence of his son Jesus he wants us to focus on Jesus and not on ourselves his perfect life on earth, his victory on the cross, his resurrection. We were singing that song, your grace is enough for me. That grace, when I say the word grace, it means God is willing, God is longing to use his power, his ability on my behalf, even though I don't deserve it. And that's what the Eucharist is. These people have gone in the wrong direction. Jesus did not 
scream at them, threaten them, punish them, but with love began to show them the right path. And that's why, my friend, when we come for the Eucharist, <coughs> grace is in abundance. These people had unbelief. Their belief was that he was a prophet. It was over. But look at Jesus. He was so quick to forgive them. When I come to the Eucharist, it is a place where God is calling us to come and cleanse ourselves from everything that is unclean. We all fall every day making mistakes. And every day we need to repent. And every day we need to change our lives. And that's why during the Eucharist you will see so many times the word mercy. So many times confessing our sins. Even before we are about to receive the body and blood of Jesus, we once again <coughs> say, Lamb of God, have mercy on me. My friend, it is a place of cleansing. Because when the virus is there in us, it brings all kinds of sickness, disease, death and destruction. <coughs> As Saint Jesus is saying to you, I died so that I could provide forgiveness for you. That sin is all the time bringing condemnation. That sin is all the time bringing guilt. And with that sin, we will never be able to fellowship with God. Sin is a barrier. And when we are invited to the Eucharist, it is a place where Jesus is calling you, inviting you and saying, Come, come to the table. He is saying, just like the Israelites had a lamb that was offered on that night for the Passover, I am the lamb that is offered for you and me. The Israelites were brought out of Egypt out of slavery. But in spite of that freedom from Egypt, they could not get Egypt out of themselves. And that's why they were grumbling, complaining, murmuring with unbelief. And they all died in the desert. Jesus instituted this Eucharist saying, I am the Passover lamb. I am the one who has come to bring you out of slavery, not only of Egypt, but out of slavery of sin. Come. Come to this banqueting table. I have prepared for you. And that's what David said in Psalms 23. Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear. Lord, for you are with me. My good shepherd is with me. His rod and his, and his staff will comfort me. And then he says, he has prepared for me a banquet in the presence of my enemies. My friend, the banquet is never in heaven because there are no enemies in heaven. Satan is not in heaven. This banqueting table is on this earth. This banqueting table is that Lord, Lord Supper, the good shepherd who loves you. He is saying, come to this table. I have prepared for you. And Psalm 23 says, He has not only prepared the banqueting table, He anoints a head with oil. When we come for the Eucharist, the Lord gives us assurance that not only your sins will be forgiven, but I am going to do something marvelous in your life. And that marvelous is, when you partake of my body and blood, you will not go back same. I will empower you with fresh anointing. And what is that anointing for? That anointing is that you will go back into the world. Not belonging to the world, but belonging to me. And overcome 
those very weaknesses where you fell in the past, you will be an overcomer. Come. Come. I will deal with that sin. I will deal with that bad habit. I will deal with that addiction. I will deal with everything. Come. He has given us an invitation. Because he is going to give us the grace to repent. And that's what happened to these two men. The moment their eyes were opened and Jesus vanished, they were filled with so much of strength and power that they did not remain in that village anymore. Even though it was dark and they said it is not good to travel, they did not wait till morning. They went back with the good news. The good news that Jesus is alive. They went with the good news about the scriptures that Jesus had explained to them. That Jesus had not come to establish the Roman Empire, but he had come to establish his kingdom where you have victory over sin, where you have victory over Satan, where you have victory over death, where you have the resurrection power, where you have eternal life. My friend, Jesus died to give us this victory. He is the one who strengthens us. Right now, that same Jesus is saying to you, I invite you for my Eucharist. I am the Passover lamb that has been offered. When the Israelites ate of my flesh, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, when they ate of the lamb, the meat of the, the flesh of the lamb, the Bible says not one of them came out sick out of Egypt. How much more, my friend, when we receive the body and blood of Jesus, that body that we receive brings healing to our body, brings healing to our emotions, brings healing to our relationship, brings healing to our finances, brings healings in every area of your life. Depression is destroyed when you come to receive the Eucharist. That's why Jesus is saying, do this in memory of me. Do not forget. Do not say, I'm so busy. He wants you to remember again and again and again about his sacrifice for you so that you can run to the Good Shepherd. He's not there to punish you with the, with the, with the, the staff. The staff that is, the Good Shepherd is there, he is supposed to comfort you. Today, the Lord is reminding each one of us that He is the one who endured all that pain for each one of us and ourselves. Let us not become so busy in things that we keep ourselves away from receiving His body and blood. He wants us to remember. He wants us to remember. My friend, even before we come to the Eucharist, even when we are preparing ourselves from home, let us remember. I want to share an incident so that you understand what Jesus did for us. There was this young man who was chosen to be a lieutenant in the army. And he went taking his group to the enemy field and there was a fight. He had kept all his boys safe and the wife fight was going on. But one of the bullet hit one of the soldiers. And he was in pain. All the soldiers were able to manage to get into safety except for this one. And he was in such a pain that he could hear his cry. This left him made a decision to save him. But he knew 
If he would go to save him, he could be killed. When everything was silent, in the dark night, he made a decision to go. He was able to save him and bring him back. But when he was very close to the camp, he got shot and he died. The wounded soldier came back home. The parents of the dead soldier came to know that this wounded soldier has come to their city, whom their son had saved. So they were all excited, the parents, and welcomed him home. They prepared good food for him. They made every kind of preparation to welcome him. But when this soldier walked into the house, he was already drunk. He spoke things that were absolutely rude, dirty. He made a lot of jokes and he did all those things. The parents with their love did everything possible to comfort him. But this man had no feelings for the parents. He was not even remembering their son who had sacrificed his life to save his life. He was there talking all nonsense and everything was over. He left that house. The father of the house shut the door. And the mother began to cry and collapsed. And she said these words, My son sacrificed to save a person like him and she could not take it. My friend, the same it is with us. The Heavenly Father is saying the same words. That my son sacrificed his life to save you and me even when we were yet sinners, even when we were rebellious, even when we were ungrateful, going away from him, yet for our sake he sacrificed for us. And that is what we need to remember that Jesus who sacrificed his life has risen. So when we come to the Eucharist, it's very important that we focus on Jesus. And the more and more we focus on Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, it brings more and more of repentance in the heart. It brings a gratitude of thanksgiving that Lord, I don't deserve this. But yet, for my sake, you took my place, became a substitute for me, and you died in my place. Lord, help me to remember this, that you are alive. You are alive. <coughs> you are alive, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I want you to take this time to talk to him, please. This is the time when the healings are taking place. This is the time that Jesus, who is alive, the Redeemer lives. <coughs> he is talking to you. He doesn't want you to come with saddened heart. He wants you to come rejoicing, believing that He is alive. He is here to solve your problem. He is not here to create a problem. He doesn't want you to keep looking at your past. All that he wants to look, you to look at is cross, that is the past. And look at yourself, that all your sins are nailed on the cross. And the future that he wants to see, he wants us to see, is that he's coming back again. The Mass is all about Jesus coming back again 
proclaiming. And that is why when we, when the priest says, this is my body and this is my blood, then we all proclaim our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and my Christ will come again. And this is our rejoicing. This is the time to rejoice. There's a story going on. But there was this man who was a missionary. And this missionary met a tribe. And in this tribe there was an infection. And people were dying. This missionary knew a hospital close by. But there was a river that they had to cross. So he went to the tribes and told them, listen, there's a hospital nearby and, and when you come to this hospital, you can be healed of, of all this infection that is taking place. But there was a problem. This tribe believed that there are spirits in that river and anyone who dips in that river would be dead. This man began to plead with them. He began to tell them that there are no spirits. He actually took them to the river and got into the water. He began to go waist deep and he said, look at me, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. He even took the water and splashed on his face. But none of them were ready to believe. He tried everything. People were dying, but they were not ready to cross the river. Then he made a decision. He went underwater and swam all across to the other side of the river. When this tribe saw that, that he had reached to the other side, safe, now they believed. They began to rejoice and those who were infected were ready to go and cross the river and reach the other side. And that's what the Eucharist is all about. Jesus came and showed the people that he's the healer. He opened blind eyes. He opened deaf ears. He made the lame walk. And he said, I'm the Messiah. People still did not believe. He even went and raised the widow's son from the dead. He also raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Not only that, he went ahead and raised Lazarus whose body was buried in the tomb. He raised him from the dead. But yet people did not believe when he died. But praise be to God. That same Jesus had to go into the river of death and come to the other side, risen. And now you and I can believe that Jesus did not only die on the cross and buried, but he has risen from the dead. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And He has risen for you and me. So can we rejoice? Yes. Or can we look at the mountain and be depressed all the time? He's alive. I said He's alive. I said He's alive. How many of you believe that? So from now on, will, you, will the mountain threaten you or will you threaten the mountain? My Redeemer lives. So when we come to the Eucharist, do we come depressed? No. You, know, you know the beautiful part of the Eucharist is, you come with your brokenness and you tell the Lord, this is where I missed my mark and I fell down God. He said, no problem. You have confessed. You have repented. No problem. Let's start again with faith. But this time, I'm going to give you the power with my body and blood. Just put the Gospel of John chapter 13. Just verse number 2. Okay, 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 okay. Just one. Can you see that now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And the supper ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, verse 
Satan inside of Adam, uh, inside of Judas? No. He had just put a thought to betray him. Praise God. But look what happened. Might be 13 verse, 15 verse, just go down. 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked on, on another, looked one on another, doubting of whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who it is? And Jesus answered, He it is to whom I give a saw which I have dipped. And when he had dipped the saw, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the saw, and after the saw, so, so, the Bible clearly says, now, now, in that same place when all these disciples were there, wasn't Peter there? Yes. Wasn't Peter going to deny Jesus? Yes. But how come when he had Satan did not enter him? How come only for Judas? Is there a partiality? When Peter received the body and blood of Jesus, did he have the thoughts of denying Jesus? No. But what about Judas? Yes. Come on. Yes. So when I have sin in me, when I have these negative thoughts in me, it's extremely dangerous. And that's why during the Mass we see it again and again. And now when you go for the Eucharist, be attentive how many times the word mercy comes, forgiveness comes from the priest, from us. Why? Because it's extremely dangerous. If I have love and if I have the desire, Lord, this is the area where I keep on falling. I want to come out of this. This is my brokenness. This is my weakness. And you will see the body and blood. That body and blood will give you the strength to overcome it. But you come and receive the body of body and blood of Jesus in an unworthy manner, in not preparing yourself, it will be extremely dangerous for you. What happened? Are you, are you listening? Yes. So, is this place a place where I can be free from any kind of bondage? Come on. Can this place be a place which should be a place of rejoicing, a place where I have been in slavery of a, a particular sin for many years and I'm not able to come out. I can come to this place of this table and tell the Lord, Lord, this is the area where I fail again and again and I want to be set free from this area. You know what he says? I will surely strengthen you and give you the power to get the victory. But I'm not the one who will fight. You are the one who will fight against that sin, but I will empower you to fight against that sin. Isn't that amazing? Come on. Come on, it is. And that's, you know, in my life, I saw that those three months that I had the Word of God and the Eucharist, in those days I had no knowledge of the Bible that much, but I saw in my life that I could only really come and say, God, I want to be set free, set free, set free. I saw the areas where I was in bondages and in sin for so many years, and I was attracted to those things, those attractions just left me. It was gone from the root. <laughs> but after so many years, as I began to go through the scriptures, these things opened up, and I saw, my God, this is all the secret. It's hidden. I need to tell this to everybody that we all can be set free from anything, from anything. No matter how many years you have been in weakness, come to the Lord. You know the good news is? He empowers you. 
The very area where you are once upon a time weak, he will empower you. How many of you have heard the song Amazing Grace? How many of you know about the writer? This writer was in every kind of sin, you name it. Whether it's drugs, prostitution, this, that, everything. And one day, he was preached the gospel and he gave his life to Jesus. From the day he received Jesus, he saw his amazing grace. You know, whenever we use the word grace, we should always remember the word grace is only given, grace is only given to the students who failed in the exam. <laughs> Come on, this is this is a truth. Come on. Even if a even if the student wants one mark more for distinction, the teacher will never give one mark more for the student. But if that same student needs 10 marks more to pass, the teacher will give 10 marks grace to pass. So whenever you say grace, it means God is giving his power, his ability, and not only giving, he's longing, he's willing to give it to us and use it on our behalf, even though we don't deserve it. So the Eucharist is a place of abundant grace. But when this grace is given, only when I come with the knowledge of tapping into this grace and using this grace, this grace in response to my faith brings manifestation. I think it, it was not very clear, right? Okay, okay. How did we receive Jesus? How, how did our relationship with Jesus began to become more real? Somebody came and began to share with us the promises of God. And especially when we were in trials. Yes? yes? At that time, what was spoken to us, did we respond to it? Come on. Now, even though we were in trials, did we make mistakes? Did we deserve to be punished? But when the word was spoken, we responded to it. Did God move on our behalf? Are you wrong? Did he move to punish us or did he move to save us? Yes. When did he move? When I respond to the gospel, when I respond to his word. So grace is everything that God has promised in his word is grace. But when I take that same word and I respond and act on it, then I am exercising my faith. So what is a Eucharist? A Eucharist is a place where God is inviting his children and saying, I know you have missed the mark. I know you have fallen, but I do not want you to stay outside. Come inside. I want to clean you up. Because when you are clean, I can have an intimate relationship with you. My fellowship with you will become personal. Praise God. And not only that, I will give you the grace. And when you use that grace by your response, you will see the power manifested in your life. Hallelujah. How many of us come to the Eucharist with this understanding that God, these are the areas where I keep on falling and after I have received, I believe by faith Lord, you have empowered me that this time I will face the same trial and I will have victory. I will fight but not with my ability now, with your grace ability and come back victorious. Come on. And once we understand that, we would want to go for the Eucharist again and again because that's when we receive Jesus personally giving us the power. Let me show you. Just go to Psalms 20, brother. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, your word and your spirit, they comfort me. Praise God. Your word and your spirit, they comfort me. Your word? Yeah, yeah, that rod and that staff stands for your word and your spirit. Because when I have your word, your word is spirit and life, right? Right? So your, your spirit is the one who enlightens me, who makes me understand. Amen? And then we look at that. Verse number five. I want all of you to read it, please. I have prepared or you have prepared. So 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 who has prepared the last supper for us? 
And that you know, before, before we go there, one more thing happened. Why did Jesus give this last supper at the last time? He could have given it before now. I always have this question. Why only on that night, Lord? Why you did not give the disciples before? You know, on that night would be the greatest battle for the disciples. He knew it. He knew it all. And he gave his body and blood for one reason. That even in this battle, even if they have to scatter this body and blood that I've given to them, and they and I are one, this will bring them back onto the same track and they will still continue with the mission that I've assigned for them. <laughs> this body and blood that we receive at the Eucharist is not only that I be free from my sin, but for me to continue as a disciple, to become like Jesus and continue on a mission to win souls for the kingdom of God, my friend, my friend, our, our mission on this planet Earth is not to earn dirhams. Our mission on this planet Earth is, I go to the office, yes, but I represent heaven. And there are some people in the office who are broken. And they will see Jesus in me and say to me, Hey brother, there is something different about you. Your, your way you talk, the way you act, everything is different. You don't get annoyed. Even though people are troubling you, you are still forgiving, you are still loving. I want to know how come you are doing this. And that's the time Jesus becomes alive to these people. And we are the people whom God has chosen. And he is inviting us to this table to become that. Hello? Are you listening? Yes. But how many of us are coming to the Eucharist to say, Lord, I want to be a missionary. A secret agent in my office representing heaven. And when somebody is in trouble, like James Bond, praise God. Hallelujah. Not the James Bond of the of the world, but James Bond of heaven, praise God with the weapons, not carnal, but spiritual, giving to those people and make, making checkmate to, to the devil. Amen. That's why when the priest when the, the mass is over, what does the priest say? <laughs> Go in peace. The mass is ended, go in peace. No. To love yourself, very good. <laughs> huh? No. To love and no. serve your spouse, very good. No. What? No. And what are we doing? <laughs> Who will come and serve me? Okay, okay, let's come back. Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemy. My friend, uh, are there, uh, is there any enemy in heaven? No. Satan is not in heaven, thank God. Hallelujah. And, and, and the best part is, the Bible says, you know, our life on earth is just a blink of an eye. Can you just blink? That's your lifespan on earth compared to the life for all eternity in heaven. Hallelujah. Some of you get temporary visas, no? Okay. Then, you anoint my head with? With? Oil. Say that, anoint. You rub it. You know, uh, when the baby is born in India, what they do? Oil massage. Why? So that if anybody wants to pick up the child, the child will be too sleepy. <laughs> So nobody can touch your child, right? Huh? Fast school. Why? So that that oil shall penetrate to the skin and make your muscles strong, the joints strong and all that. In the same way, when he says anoint, his, his life begins to rub into us and go into us and strengthen us and empower us and he anoints us with what? Oil. Now let me show you what is that oil. Isaiah 10 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke and the yoke and the yoke because of the. Where is Albert? 
A ver, ¿verdad? How soon? Because I want to go. Can I take your dupatta, please? Is that the dupatta, right? Okay, thanks, thanks. Just, just take that dupatta. Yeah. Well, you have to call a special person for that. Yeah. Now, let's say it is sacred. <laughs> See, I can't call somebody else because somebody might get offended. He won't get offended, I know that. Please go. Now, now, I am in a bondage, right? And this is a yoke. I want to be at home, but this yoke is taking me to the bar. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They don't want to know what Okay? Now, when I've been set 
free and anointed by God. Praise God. Now when I walk, what is following me? <laughs> so the same person, a witness of the kingdom of darkness, the same person repenting and receiving the body of body and blood of Jesus, now be present in heaven, experiencing the manifestation of God's glory. And that's why he says, surely. Surely. So when we come for the Eucharist, he's giving you an assurance. Not only your life will change, but surely you will see God's goodness come on you and from you will flow the mercy of God in other people's life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But what happens to those of us when we fail to repent, when we fail to change our lives? All this what God has given. And then that's what he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me only some days. Oh, huh? oh, so many of us who are sitting here and saying, in my old age, what will happen? What will happen? <laughs> Already test, so I have to save for my old age. Nobody will be there and all that. Yet the Lord is saying, you come to my banqueting table, I will anoint you with oil, I will anoint you with my life, that you will be walking in victory and you will be seeing my goodness follow you just like the shadow follows you when you are in the sunlight. So, is there a shadow in the, in the dark night? What about in the sunlight? And what about the sun's light? S O N. Hallelujah. So, what will be your shadow when the sun's light, goodness and mercy? So, everywhere you go, you are a person now of mercy. So, when you come out of the Eucharist, you are a friendly person or merciful person? <laughs> the house of the Lord? For some time. Wait. No, wait, wait. Ten minutes after. Okay. Only don't talk in Konkani. Sure you are enjoying? Minor. This is true. So what happens when you receive the Eucharist? The Eucharist changes our mind. When our minds are changed, our direction is changed, our thinking is changed, everything is changed. Praise God. Praise God. Okay, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's a good example of what happens after the Eucharist. Praise the Lord. And what happened to those two? And what happens to us are two different things. We used to go for Eucharist before. Sometimes, most of the time it was to meet people. Then come out and listen to the talks or give my talks. About what? About the problems that I am facing. So, what is the use of this mass that we were attending? What is the... What was... God's plan, what was the plan of Jesus to institute the sacrament of Eucharist? Praise the Lord. So, what we talk is the, the showing what should happen after the Mass? Goodness and mercy shall follow. Or we should say, uh, immediately after going for Mass, how are you? Oh, you know, I am suffering from diabetes, I am suffering from heart problems. Or am I surely goodness means good health has followed me now? What is supposed to follow? Those who are sick when you go for mass, why are you going for mass? And why are you, what are you coming with after the mass? Praise the Lord. Are we still talking about the same problem which we had come? With what intention did we come? Did we come surely that goodness and mercy shall follow me? Uh, I'm just coming back. After receiving the body and blood of Jesus. Am I saying that or I am just attending the Mass? No, I am hearing. I am hearing. We don't hear the Mass, we participate in the Mass. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you, are, when you come to a party, are you coming to hear or you are coming to... <laughs> I am being 
आप करना पेंडोलिंग के ऊपर क्या करते हैं? Why do we come to a pendulum table to eat? Drink can be. What happens then? We are completely flat. But here the goodness and mercy shall follow me some days or all the days. Oh, I was supposed to say, you know, when the child was small, he was very good. Now he doesn't listen to me. Now he doesn't. Just he was a prophet. Jesus was a prophet. Is Jesus a prophet for me now? Is Jesus the savior for me now, or was a savior? Am I talking of my only past, only my sorrows, or am I talking of my Easter? These two men, did they hear that Jesus was risen? Yes. Yes? Yes. But did they believe or they chose to believe only what they had seen on the cross? We are also stuck with same things, what we have seen at home, what we have seen in the doctor's report, we are stuck to that, right? What we have seen in the company, uh, what do you call that? Um, jobs, uh, what do you call that? Recession. We are only stuck to those things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where are we supposed to be stuck to? Resurrection. The Easter. Goodness and mercy. Can you see goodness and mercy? Did they see resurrection? Resurrected Christ? No. But should they believe? Because Jesus had already spoken. Now the word of God is so dangerous, you know. When we began to learn this 15 years back to Brother Johnson, many of uh, many who were with us were like uh, set on fire with the word of God. So much fire is that some of them went and started doing some uh, degree courses in the Bible. And as they were doing the degree courses, they got a what do you call it? The, when you do BA, when you do MA, you get a you get a Black, black cat. Black cat is from this That is called the Jeffrey. And some of them even left the Catholic Church. And you know, so the word of God is very dangerous if you don't know and if you have not recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Many times even me and Brother Johnson have felt that you know we have not attended the Eucharist as we were supposed to be. God is opening our eyes as we are learning from last month in Goa. The, the scriptures on how the eyes were opened, our eyes have opened, praise God. And uh, last month we had also said that we will meet at 12 o'clock for the Eucharist. Come for the 12 o'clock Eucharist, then we will follow with the word of God. All will take the word of God and then there is the Eucharist as well. Praise the Lord. Let this uh, word of God be a different word of God which will be opening up our eyes and believing in the goodness and mercy of God all the days of our life. Not some days. Not the days of recession. We say, oh no, now the days are not very good. Now the petrol crisis or whatever, what's happening. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we all close our eyes? Praise God. Pope Francis gives a wonderful message as well on the Eucharist. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, he says this is a place for repentance, it's a place to forgive, it's a place to get united back with the Father. And with one another. With one another. When we get connected, that's why the cup runneth over. Why it's running over? To share. To share our life with others. Because the connection with God is so much that the cup is running over. After the Mass, what we speak is what is supposed to run over the goodness and mercy from our life. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another good news that is still hidden in the Vatican, something beautiful things are happening. Uh, it seems the, our brothers who are over once upon a time protesting against this uh, beautiful Eucharist and uh, sacrament of confession are meeting, Pope Francis is meeting all of them and some of our great leaders, our brethren from the Protestant Church have accepted the sacrament of uh, confession and sacrament of Eucharist and they have even for the first time in life they have gone for a confession and they have received a body of blood. God is 
opening everyone's eyes. Jesus had opened their eyes that time. It takes time. Praise God. Let's believe that God is just like once upon a time, Brother Johnson was here seven years back. We were outside. Nobody could believe that we could be inside. But God had a plan to bring us inside. When the heart is good, when the intention is good, God will bring us inside. Hallelujah. God has also opened Sharjah. We are in the chapel today. Six thirty to nine here. This God. Six thirty to nine. Let's thank the Lord for this great things God is doing. Let's bless Bishop uh, Paul and let's bless Father Michael, uh, our teacher director here, then the parish priest and the parish priest of Sharjah, and so many bishops and parish priests who are inviting Brother Johnson to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. <laughs> And God bless you for your prayers. There is nothing impossible with God. When we are with God, there is nothing impossible. Hallelujah. So the church unity is also happening very fast. Hallelujah. We are all coming together. The prayer that Jesus has left that all may be one is happening. Thank you for your prayers. God bless you. Hallelujah.